So to go ahead and turn to Job chapter 4, we're going to look at 4, 6, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And uh, we're continuing through this book, <clears throat> asking really the question, how big is your God? Because that is a question that Job is facing in his life, and as we'll go through this book, over and over again, that question is going to get posed to him, either with his own, from his own heart and conscience, or from these wonderful friends that are now surrounding him. And uh, as you recall, uh, there in the beginning of the book of Job, uh, he was considered not only by all those around him, but by God himself, as a man who was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. And he was one of the greatest people in all of the East. So Job obviously was extremely blessed. But as we already have learned and will continue to learn, that that blessing wasn't a reward for Job's righteousness and for his diligence. It was simply God loving him. And because of that, Satan approached God in the heavens there and, and challenged the situation and, and basically said, well, Job loves you and he obeys you because you give him everything that he needs and pretty much everything he wants. Who wouldn't? And so God gives Satan the opportunity or the permission rather to go ahead and take all of those things from Job and see if indeed it's all attached to the stuff and the things of this earth rather than a true and honest and faithful relationship with God. And from chapter 1 and also chapter 2, as we see Job being stripped of his wealth, of his family, and even of his health, his response is that he understands as best he can that God is sovereign. And within that sovereignty, God can do whatever he wants. Because he came naked into this world from his mother's womb, he'll return there naked as well. God gave and God has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And even as he mentions to his wife, as she says, do we have to endure this any further? Her heart too is breaking from the loss of their ten children. All, of, all together, suddenly, in one day, in one moment. I, I can't imagine losing one child. They say it's the hardest thing because it's the most unnatural in the progression, right? It's fairly natural to bury your parents. That's because they're older. And it's even a little more natural to maybe bury a peer, one of your, even your spouse. But losing a child, that's taking the whole thing and flipping it on its ear. And it should never be that way, that parents have to bury their children. And here, Job and his wife had to put all ten of their children to rest into the ground literally and as his wife approached him and said why don't you just curse God and die are you holding fast to your integrity Job are you are you hanging on and Job's response there in chapter 2 verse 10 you speak as one of the foolish women speaks shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity and all this Job did not sin with his lips and then we're introduced to his three friends who come. They heard about what had happened to Job, and in all good intention, they conspire together in a good way to meet. And somewhere along the line, it sounds like, as we get into more and more of the book, that they talked about what they should discuss with Job or how they would approach it. And yet when they finally got there and they saw him, now diseased, and now having these boils from head to foot, and, and sitting there on the ash heap and the, the garbage dump outside of town, scraping his sores, his dried up sores, with, the, with a, 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 a shard of pottery, just to get some relief from all of the, the pain and the itching. They hardly recognized him. And with all of the words they may have had prepared, all they could do was sit down there with him, for seven days and mourn with him. They tore their own clothes. They put dust on their own heads. They even wept 
lifted up their voices and sat in silence. And last week we saw that that silence was broken finally by Job as he begins to speak really deploring the very day of his birth because there was nowhere else that he could go. I, it's even hard for me to actually imagine. You know, they always say, unless you walk in someone's shoes. You know, don't try to judge them. Don't try to figure out what they're going through. And that's, that's pretty accurate. It's, it really is. And as we'll see, even beginning tonight, uh, these three friends weren't very good at that. Just trying to empathize with Job right where he was at. But this grief being so deep, and him not having any answers as to why any of this happened. Because I'm sure that Job, as we'll see tonight again, at some point began to search his heart. And maybe even pray, Lord, what have I done wrong? Is there something in my life that has brought this about? And he could find nothing. As he searched, as he wondered, as he prayed, he could find no one thing that seemed to be the reason why all of this calamity came upon him. We know because the veil of heaven was pulled back and the purpose was so that the blasphemies, blasphemies of Satan would be stilled. Even when Satan touched his body and took his health, he still didn't curse God. Does Job serve you for nothing? Does he fear God for nothing was Satan's question. Well, he continued to fear God and he hoped so he could hear from him because he wasn't and we'll even get an indication tonight that we're probably months down the road now. Job wished he had never been born or that maybe he had been stillborn and realizing God's sovereignty, then he at least wished that in this moment he could just die because then there would be rest. Then the ache in his heart would be gone. He would be numb to it once and for all. At least that was his thinking. So he kind of broke that barrier of silence with his own mourning, his own wailing, literally, that pain that comes from a heart that's broken. And I think part of the reason why Job is in the Bible and why it's so important for us to study is because at some point in all of our lives, we will either experience this kind of grief for ourselves or we'll know someone close to us that is and will. And the two things that we hope to gain from studying this book together, as we mentioned in our first study, is one, how to deal with trials ourselves, and two, how to help someone else in their trial, in their place of affliction and adversity. And like I can say to you, when I've gone through, through some of the tragedies in my life that have been very difficult... Um, it was very, very easy to very quickly weed out who the effective friends would be and the non-effective. I, I wouldn't say good friends and bad friends because they were all friends. They were all of good intention. I wouldn't cast any of them aside or reject them. But there were a handful of those that I knew were going to be very, very helpful to me. And for the most part, they're the ones that sat next to me in silence with me, listened to me when I was unreasonable and when I would cry out like Job did and not judge me for it. Not have to try to come up with some kind of an answer or a solution because there never really is one outside of God himself. So now that Job has kind of broke open the conversation, we met these three men, Eliphaz, and Bildad and Zophar last week. And we determined by the listing there that Eliphaz was probably the oldest, then Bildad, then Zophar. And so Eliphaz is also the first to speak. And so he begins, and as Job has just finished, really pouring out his heart in this grief, Eliphaz now hooks into the things that he said, but unfortunately what these three friends do is they're not listening to Job's heart. They're just hearing them with their own heads. They're going at him for what he is saying, and we all know when you're distressed, there's a lot of times you say things that are not reasonable. There's a lot of times you say things you don't even mean, but they're just 
just the emotion that you try to somehow put to words and, and they sort of just spew out of you in a lot of times very irrational ways. So then verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, Then Eliphaz the Timnite answered and said, Now watch how he kind of tiptoes into this. If one attempts a word with you, will you become weary? But who can withhold himself from speaking? So he gets just like a little disclaimer. Job, are you okay if I say something? If I, if I jump in here, I, I mean, are you going to be all right? Are you going to be weary in me saying something? And notice he doesn't wait for an answer. He doesn't wait for half a second to see Job, if Job's going to say something. Because I think if he would have waited, Job might have said, can we just be quiet for a little bit longer? Can I just listen to the grumblings of my own heart for a bit? But then he, Eliphaz comes right in and, but who could simply withhold himself from speaking? You have to realize, Job, these things that you're saying, oh my goodness, there's so many things that I want to respond to. Let me ask you guys, how many of you think you're a good listener? Yeah, maybe a few hands are going up. It's an art, isn't it? Not everybody is. And you know what we do the most, what we're guilty of the most, is when someone's speaking to us, and especially if it's in conversation. See, I have an advantage here. I'm speaking, and the expectation is, is that no one's going to respond, or no one's going to say anything. You're going to sit kindly and listen, and hopefully stay to the end of the service. It's not a back and forth. But when we have those back and forths, the thing that we're guilty of the most is as we are, listen to someone pouring out their hearts, especially as soon as we have a point, as soon as there's something in what they're saying, that we go, oh, I want to respond to that. Oh, there's something that I have a, also have an opinion about. Guess what happens? We no longer listen to anything else that person says. We are just waiting for them to stop long enough so we can slide our opinion in there or give our two cents. And when we do, and that person who has just finished speaking realizes that we're going back two paragraphs, we now also realize, wow, they really haven't been listening to me at all, have they? They really just want to give their opinion. Well, here we have Eliphaz. Who can withhold himself from speaking? So he jumps right in. He steps out cautiously, but he does step out with both feet. And in verses uh, 2 through 4, he basically starts, in a sense, giving Job a compliment, but look at how sideways it is. Verse 3, Surely you have instructed many, and you have straightened weak hands, strengthened weak hands, and your words have up upheld him who was stumbling, and you have strengthened the feeble knees. Job, you've been the one everybody's come to. You've been the wise one in this entire area. When anyone had any trouble, when anyone had any distress, they came to you for advice. They came for, to you for wisdom. And you were always able to somehow strengthen them. I love that. You have strengthened the feeble knees. Those that, that really were so distraught they could hardly even stand in front of you. Maybe even fell to their knees trying to explain what was going on in their lives. You were the one that was there for them. But verse 5, but now it comes upon you, and you are weary. It touches you, and you are troubled. Is not your reverence, your confidence, and the integrity of your ways, your hope? You see, trouble now has come home to roost, hasn't it, Job? Eliphaz is being so sensitive, isn't he? You're this wise man. You always had advice for everybody else. And guess what? The first time you get hit, and you don't even want to take a good spoonful of your own medicine. Job, listen to yourself. What advice would you have given yourself? Because what you just said about wanting to die and cursing the day of your birth certainly doesn't sound like the wisdom that's poured out of you in the past. What's wrong with you? You have nothing to say for yourself. Verse 6, is your reverence or is your fear of God not your confidence? And, and this integrity that you hold to, isn't that your hope? Why aren't you now relying on that? You see, I think that it might have freaked these guys out a little bit to see this rock. This is Job. 
Job's the man. He's the guy we go to. He's like the great and powerful Oz, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. He's the one with all the answers. And there they see him now and in, in, in silence, and then he breaks out in this lament, like, where did that come from? I think it freaked them out. It scared these guys to no end. Gosh, if Job doesn't have the answers, who does? Well, I guess we better give him some then. We need to get him back on his feet, and we need to set him straight. He hasn't gotten this right. This has taken way too long. We need to get to the bottom of this immediately. So now we see Eliphaz jump right into his theology. Look at verse 7. Remember now whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright ever cut off? Now that's a fancy way of saying, if you do what's right, should anything bad ever happen to you? I don't think so. Or where were those that, that were innocent, those that have been upright, where were they ever cut off like you've been cut off, Job? So we need to start ferreting down into this and realize there's got to be something really, really bad happening in your life here. Or this bad stuff wouldn't be going on around you. This, by the way, is not an example of how to help someone through their trials. You want to pay attention to this. As a matter of fact, I'd, I'd sometimes wonder as I read through Job, why is this whole middle section of these conversations back and forth, why did God, by His Holy Spirit, go out of His way to record every word that was spoken among these guys? Well, I think and I hope we'll discover that as we go. But a lot of it is not what to do, but what not to do. And how much of the Bible really teaches us that way, don't they? Doesn't it? What not to do. We see the Israelites time again. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't follow that example. Yet in Jesus we see the example to follow. So verse 8. Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and who sow trouble reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his anger they are consumed. The roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lion are broken. The old lion perishes for the lack of prey, and the cubs of the lioness are scattered. So Eliphaz is saying, okay, here's what happens to those that are sinners, to the unrighteous, to those that have some kind of hidden sin or problem, iniquity in their life. They've trespassed in some way then it's going to come upon them either slowly, like plowing a field and setting up for harvest. It's kind of that gradual judgment that comes from the Lord. Or it comes in an instant, like a storm, like the blast of God, the breath of His anger that consumes areas. Or like the attack of a lion that's just one minute you're just walking down the street and the next minute you're being mauled. But he's also alluding to something else here in this section. Basically, this lion that he's speaking of is Job himself, the old lion perishing for lack of prey and the cubs being scattered. That's exactly what happened to Job's kids. Because of some kind of sin, because something went on. I mean, this was the greatest man of the East. But the hunter has come and has... has scattered his cubs, or in Job's case, they've all died. Job's been helpless in all of this to do anything. So Eliphaz goes on, verse 12. Now a word was secretly brought to me. Now this is an interesting section. One thing we'll discover about Eliphaz is that he bases most of what he's telling Job on two things, an experience he had and observations that he's made the experience he had and observations that he's made so again verse 12 now a word was secretly brought to me here's his experience and my ear received a whisper of it it disquieted thoughts in disquieted thoughts from the visions of the night when deep sleep falls on men fear came upon me and trembling which made all of my bones to shake then a spirit passed before my face, and the hair on my body stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence, and then I heard a voice saying, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? 
Can a man be more pure than his maker? If he puts, if he puts no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with no error, how much more those who dwell in the houses of clay and those whose foundations is in the dust, who are crushed before, uh, before a moth. They are broken in pieces until the evening. They perish forever with no one regarding. Does not their own excellence go away? They die even without wisdom. What in the world is all that? I wish I could tell you. No, I'm kidding. We'll make, we'll make an attempt. So Eliphaz has this vision. Now, it could well have been a dream that he meditated on for so long, he now interprets it as some kind of vision from God. First of all, let's determine, does this sound like it came from God? It doesn't, does it? It's pretty suspect. And most scholars believe that it didn't. As a matter of fact, nowhere in here does it say, thus saith the Lord. And God's not in the habit of sneaking up on people and scaring you to the point where the hair on your arms and everywhere else stands up straight. When God comes in, he may come in like a flood and his very presence may cause you, like we saw with Daniel and we saw with the Apostle John, to fall on your face, even in the presence of a holy angel. So there's that kind of fear and trembling, but that's different. That's not like that kind of human fear that just grips you and uh, the angst that sets in. And yet this is what Eliphaz is basing it on, that he, he had this weird thing that happened in the middle of the night and this spirit supposedly passed in front of him. It freaked him out. Uh, he couldn't discern it's what it was or who it was, but yet it, it had a voice and it began to speak to him all of these things about man. Is he, is he better than God or more righteous or more pure than his maker? I mean, if this, this deity, if God doesn't even trust his servants, the angels that he has with him, then how much more will he not trust those that are in houses of clay, the foundations of dust? It's referring to mankind. We're made of dirt. We're made of clay. Not houses literally of clay that we're living in, but that's what our shell is. And and and. Our lives are here and gone in no time at all, crushed like before a moth, you know, stepping on a moth, or, or broken into pieces so that we perish and no one even regards or notices. Does not their excellence go away, even, and they die even without wisdom? One thing for sure, Eliphaz wasn't telling the whole truth about the relationship between God and man. You see, his slant is that God is this, this, this stringent lawgiver who never bends, and there is no room whatsoever for grace. So Job, there's sin in your life, and I know this because of this vision that I had and this wisdom that was given to me in that God regards man and has no trust in him whatsoever to the point where he even, like his angels and like all of his servants, sort of considers them set aside. And their lives are just here and there. They're here today, gone tomorrow. No real unconditional love, no consideration from a deity. Yes, man lives in a house of clay and eventually turns to dust. And he can be snuffed out like the swatting of a moth. Yes, but... Man is also made in God's image, is he not? And that God who created him is a God of grace and mercy as well as justice. You see the incredible imbalance that Eliphaz is bringing here. Well, he goes on in chapter 5. Now he's going to argue from observation, not just experience. And by the way, you want to be very, very careful about that. You know, we all do have experiences in our lives, and some of them weave their way into our testimony. The things that, that God did in our lives to, to convert us, to get our attention early on, all of those things wonderful. But make sure that you can balance all of that back against His Word. Because if we rely only on our experiences, we can get into a lot of trouble. 
if we determine that a certain experience is somehow linked to God, we can get in a heap of trouble. Because before you know it, we'll be looking for that instead of for the Lord himself. And we've seen aberrant Christian doctrine come up through some of those things, through what's more experienced than anything else. Remember that wave that came through of holy laughter? That was a while back, right? Maybe the late 90s, right around the turn of the millennium there. Holy laughter, all based on an experience. Nothing biblical to back it up. And yet it, it swept through a lot of churches. People just belly laughing on the floor uncontrollably. What was that all about? Not of the Lord. And we don't hear about it anymore, do you? So I guess it didn't last the test of time. Need to be very careful about experience. Well, we also need to be careful about observation because our eyes, brothers and sisters, are tainted by flesh. We can only see what's right in front of us. And what does the Bible say? Man looks at the outward, but God looks at the heart. Well, look at what Eliphaz continues on with here in chapter 5. Call out now. Is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? For wrath kills a foolish man, and envy slays a simple one. These are all things that Eliphaz has observed. He's watched this happen, and so now he's starting to make these conclusions of truth based on the things that he's seen. Verse 3, I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his dwelling place. His sons are far from safety. They are crushed in the gate. There is no deliverer. Because the hungry eat up his harvest, taking it even from the thorns, and the snare snatches their substance. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring up from the ground. Yet man is born to trouble as its sparks fly upward, as the sparks fly upward. So here Eliphaz is saying, Job, here's the things that I've observed. I've observed these things about the, the, the poor and the foolish. The foolish man that wrath kills him. That, that, that the, the simple ones are enslaved. And as a matter of fact, I've seen those foolish ones taking root like they've got something going. And then before you know it, I come back a little bit later and it's all gone. It's all destroyed. Now, Catch the subtlety here, because Eliphaz is just sort of talking about his observations, but you know what he's, notice what he's weaving in. Very subtly, I have seen the foolish take root, and suddenly I cursed his dwelling place. In other words, I've seen those that have had a lot of stuff, Job, and then all of a sudden I came one day and they had nothing. And I, my conclusion is, is because of their unrighteousness. Because of their sin. Look at verse 4. His sons are far from safety. They are crushed in the gate. If that's not a direct slam, I don't know what is. How did Job's children die? They were all in a house together. And a great wind came out, blew the pillars off of the side of the house. And all of their children were crushed. Word of that got around. And now kind old Eliphaz, trying to make his point. Trying to get Job to fess up to his own sin. There's got to be something, Job. Look at what he's saying. Here's an observation I've made. Yeah, I've seen the sons afar from safety. They are crushed to the gate. There is no deliverer. Affliction that comes. But you know these troubles, Job, aren't accidental. They don't just come up from the dust. They don't just pop up anywhere. It's all from man. Man is born to trouble just like sparks fly upward. It's, it's, to him, it's a, a done deal, I guess you could say. That's it. We'll just put that in stone. Man is born in trouble, just as sure as a spark is going to fly upward. Does trouble all come from man? Are you noticing one element, at least so far, and we've already gone through a chapter, that Eliphaz is leaving out? I shouldn't say element, one being. He mentions nothing about the enemy, does he? He mentions nothing about Satan. And we happen to know he's the very cause of all of this stuff. 
the reason Job is in this anguish. But Eliphaz has got his perspective skewed. He, he puts a lot more stock in those things that he has experienced and the things that he has observed. Well, now Eliphaz makes his appeal, verse 8. But as for me, I would seek, if I were you, Job, I would seek God, and to God I would commit my case. Who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number? Now, Eliphaz is going to give a little commentary on what he believes the, to be the sovereign hand of God. He gives the rain, verse 10, he gives the rain on the earth and sends water on the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. He catches the wise in their own craftiness and the counsel of the cunning come quickly upon them. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope at noontime as in the night. But he saves the needy from the sword and from the mouth of the mighty and from their hands. So the poor have hope and injustice shuts her mouth. So Job, here's your only hope. You need to repent, buddy. You need to seek God. You need to try to find him. Commit your case to him. Because this is who he is. This is the greatness of who he is. These are the things that he can do. And really, there's quite a bit of accuracy in these attributes of God. Eliphaz isn't too far off here. But the point he's trying to make, again, is to, to rub in Job's face that there has to be some kind of unrighteousness in his life or these things would not have happened. You see the conclusion they're constantly coming to? Bad things bring bad circumstance, right? And good people, people that walk uprightly, will always walk in goodness. And we know that's not true because we've seen really good people, even in our own body, in our own church, that love the Lord and are faithful, going through hard things, tremendously tough, tragic things. We need to have the right answers for those folks, not this skewed perspective that Eliphaz is bringing in. You know, he's kind of saying Job must have been in pretty bad shape for God to take away all of his wealth, his family, and his health in order to straighten him out. <laughs> you know, it's true that discipline is a tool of God's love, but when he does it, it brings that restoration. Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Well, let's see what Eliphaz has next as he tries to end this dissertation some, with some kind of assurance. It's like, all right, I've hit you pretty hard, Job. Let me give you some assurance here when that'll take us to the end of this chapter, verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God correct, corrects. He's kind of saying the same thing that Proverbs does. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. For he bruises, but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. He shall deliver you in six troubles. Yes, in seven, no evil shall touch you. Again, you do right, you do good, and everything will be fine. In famine, he shall redeem you from death and in war from the power of the sword. He shall be hidden from the, you shall be hidden from the scourge of the tongue. That would be a pleasant thing. And you shall not be afraid of destruction when it comes. And you shall laugh at destruction and famine, and you shall not be afraid of the beasts of the earth. For you shall have a covenant with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with you. Now this was in, in an... In an agrarian society, this was a great blessing to consider. That you shall have a covenant with the stones of the field. In other words, when you go out to plow your fields, you're going to have a promise that you're not going to run into stony ground. It's all going to be fertile. It's all going to be soft enough for you to plow through and, and be able to get your, your uh, uh, crop out there. And also the beasts of the field, those that are in your care, shall be at peace with you. They'll, they'll obey you. They'll... They'll come in when they're supposed to, go out when they're supposed to. Verse 24, you shall know that your tent is in peace. 
you shall visit your dwelling and find nothing amiss. See, these are all promises that he's trying to give assurance here. But again, it's based on only if you fly right. Verse 25, you shall also know that your descendants shall be many and your offspring like the grass of the earth. And you shall come to the grave at a full age and a sheaf of grain ripens in its season. Behold, this we have searched out. It is true. Oh, really? Hear it and know for yourself. <laughs> so apparently the three of these guys have talked together. This is what he's saying. Behold, we, this we, have searched out. It is true. Hear it and know it for yourselves. We've discussed this, Job. These things that I've just shared with you. And yes, indeed, all of these good things can be yours if you call today. And if you call today for 1995, we'll give you a set of Ginsu knives. But isn't that what Eliphaz is saying? Bargain with God. Really do it. And if you think about it for just a moment, it was only a couple chapters ago that someone else was saying, well, if you just give him what he wants, he'll bless you, he'll obey you, he'll remain righteous, but you take all that away, he'll curse you to your face. See, Eliphaz is saying the exact same thing in some more flowery words as Satan was. Job, you can have it all back. Your descendants, many, your offspring like the grass of the earth. And you'll go to the grave at a full age and sheaves of grain ripened. It is all going to be wonderful. Just bargain it out. Just set yourself before the Lord and say, okay, I'll do this and this if you do these other things. <laughs> we can't. Nor should we ever bargain with God. Oh, we can. But... Let me know how it works for you. It's fruitless. Absolutely. Well, he kind of puts a punctuation on his little dissertation here. Hear it and know it for yourself. So take it in, Job. Consider it. I'm going to be quiet now. I'm sure that Job took a nice deep breath. First of relief. Good. Can we go back to silence? But then he thought for a moment... And he thought, wait a minute, I need to respond to this. You need to understand why I was so distraught back there in chapter 3. Of course, he didn't say chapter 3, but just a few moments ago when, when I said all of those things, you're not hearing what's going on inside my heart, you guys. You're not helping me at all. Your arguments are not helping. He'll even say that in a little bit. Then Job, verse 1 of chapter 6, six answered and said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed, and my calamity laid out, on, uh, out with, laid with it sorry, on the scales. For then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words have been rash. Don't you get it? Don't go off of what I said. I, I'm hurt. I'm saying things that... I'm sure don't make sense to you because they don't make sense to me. I know that God is sovereign and I believe my integrity is intact. And I also believe that we need to know a God who will do whatever He wants. He's, he's in control of everything. And if we don't trust that, then we have no hope whatsoever. And as we move forward in that trust, He can do what He wants and sometimes He'll take Sometimes he'll give. Sometimes it will be good. Sometimes it will be adverse. But blessed be the name of the Lord. He knows what he's doing. Blessed be his name. Yeah, I said some rash things. Please hear me. Because now he's going to let us in on what's going on there inside of his heart. You know, they didn't feel the heaviness of Job's suffering. And give Job a break. He didn't have the revelation of heaven like we do. Keep that in mind. We, because of Jesus' finished work, and we're learning about it on Sunday mornings, going to the cross. Because of that, we have heaven waiting. We know we can look beyond, and sometimes we still don't, but we have the ability to look beyond this circumstance, this life, this situation, 
to what's to come. Job didn't have that advantage. He couldn't write like Paul did there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 16. Therefore, do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and external, I'm sorry, exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. See, that's the hope we have. There's something better. There's something out there waiting for us that's beyond even our imagination. Job didn't have that advantage. And these guys didn't understand it. So he lets them in on just a little bit of his bitterness. Verse 4. For the arrows of the Almighty are within me. My spirit drinks in their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. Does the wild donkey bray when it has grass? Or does the ox low over its fodder? In other words, if an animal is not hungry for something, are you going to hear him? No, he's going to have his face stuck in the trough. So if you hear me braying like a donkey or lowing like an ox, then there must be a hunger in there somewhere. There's a, there's a void in there. I need some love. I need some understanding from you guys. Not rebuke. I love this. Verse 6, can flavorless food be eaten without salt? I know, unless you've heard from your doctor lately. Keep pouring the salt on. It makes the food taste good. I like this one too. Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Have you had one of those egg white sandwiches? I had one the other day, and you know what it, the experience to me was like? Like eating to the middle of the sandwich and you never get there. You know what I mean? Because you keep waiting. That yolk's got to be there somewhere, and before you know it, you've eaten to the other side, and you never got there. I, I totally get this. Is there any taste in the white of an egg? That is the most practical verse in the entire Bible. What Job is saying is, come on, guys. You know, what, what, hear my heart. Would I be doing this for nothing? Am I going to eat something that's flavorless? Verse 7, my soul refuses to touch them. They are as loathsome, loathsome food to me. Uh, no, thank you. No, thank you. Like a starving animal, he was hungry for love. See, they didn't understand the bitterness of his suffering. Job felt like, like God's target was there on his back and the arrows with this poison of bitterness were coming, be, being shot from God into him time and time again. And these friends were adding to the problem. Well, he goes on. Now he tries to tell them or get them to feel the hopelessness of his situation. Verse 8. Oh, that I might have my request that God would grant me the thing that I long for. He's hopeless. Where else can I go? That it would please God to crush me. He still wants to die. And that he would loose his hand and cut me off. Then I would still have comfort. Though in anguish I would exult, he will not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. I've, I've not kept anything of God to myself. I, I haven't been a, a secret follower. You guys even said it yourselves. I, all people come to me for wisdom. I haven't withheld any of that. But in this pain, in this hopelessness, I still wish that God would just end my life. Verse 11, what strength do I have that I should hope? And what is my end that I should prolong my life? Is my strength like the strength of the stones or my flesh like bronze? Is my help not within me? And is success driven from me? Here Job is trying to get them to get a sense of that hopelessness he has. Still looking for God to end his life. And we'll get an indication here soon that this has been going on for a while. I don't know if you've ever had any kind of long-term or prolonged suffering, especially physical suffering, because physical suffering has a way of, of just really 
absorbing all of your attention, doesn't it? It's always there. And you go through your day, I mean, it could be something as simple as one of those nagging headaches that just doesn't go away. And you've already tried to take something from it, for it. And, and, and everything you do, and eventually when you get through your day, if you've had to work and all that, you get home, all you want to do is just turn the lights off and, and just be still. Well, can you imagine prolonged or some kind of chronic suffering? It, it has a way to cause you to lose heart. Like he did in verse 11. What strength do I have that I should hope? And what is my end that I should prolong my life? If you can't control the things around you, then how can you plan for the future? Right? So Job is faced with that. And his friends, they were healthy and comfortable. They had no idea what it was like to wake up each morning to another day of suffering. And even as we'll see in a minute, sleep was not a luxury either. Look at verse 14. Job's now going to state his disappointment in his friends. To him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friends, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. That's a profound statement. Think about it. To him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friends, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. Are you a really good friend? Are you an unconditional friend? Then you should be willing to stick by that person, not that you condone their wickedness or their waywardness, but you are willing to stick by them even if they lose that fear of the Almighty. You'll stick with them until they're restored. Verse 15, My brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook, like the streams of the brook that will pass away. Now, he, he goes through this idea of the way a river or a brook starts and how it ends up, verse 16, which are dark because of the ice and into which the snow vanishes. In other words, the snow melts and the, river, the rains come and fill the riverbed. But when it is warm, they cease to flow. When it is hot, they vanish from their place. The paths of their way turn aside. They go nowhere and perish. The caravans of Tima look. The travelers of Sheba hope for them. But they are, they are disappointed because they, are, uh, because they were confident, but they come there and are confused. For now you are nothing. You see terror and are afraid. Did I ever say, bring something to me, or offer a bribe for me from your wealth, or deliver me from my enemy's hand, or redeem me from the hand of the oppressor? So basically what Job is saying here is you've got to realize, and he already knows that this is not just coming from Eliphaz, who's already spoken first. All three of them are in agreement. You're not helping me any. You're, you're like a brook. You're like a riverbed that just flows like crazy in the rainy season. Well, when do you need it? Why do you need a river in the rain? You don't, right? You collect that rain yourself. You got the buckets out. You got what you need. When do you need a river? In the summer, when there's no water, and yet what does the river do? What does the brook do? It, it withers up, it dries, it's useless. As a matter of fact, it's even deceptive because you may be out there traveling, just, just looking for something to drink, and you see a line of trees, and you're thinking, there's got to be water there. Well, those are only trees that have held on waiting for the next rain because you get there and the brook is absolutely dried out. And even the caravans that come and search for it and hope for it, they finally get there and there's nothing. That's what your advice has been so far. That's what your arguments have done for me. Then to finish out the chapter, verse 24. Teach me and I will hold my tongue. Cause me to understand wherein I have erred. So here, Job is now going to challenge them. Okay, if I'm wrong, then you show me. Give evidence of where I have sinned. Verse 25, how forceful are right words, but what does your arguing prove? So he's saying there, you know, if you were speaking honestly, your words might hurt, but I'd receive them. But this arguing, and what he was saying is, you're arguing just to defend your own point. You're not helping me any, not whatsoever. And like he said in the previous section, did I ask you to come? 
Did I ask you to be here and to deliver me or, or to, to pay a bribe on my behalf? No. Verse 26, do you intend to rebuke my words and the speeches of a desperate one, which are as wind? You know, I, I don't even know what I'm saying, yet you're rebuking me. Yes, you overwhelm the fatherless and you undermine your friend. Now, therefore, be pleased to look at me. Now, this is interesting. Up to this point, apparently, they haven't even looked at Job. He was so grotesque in his disease, they couldn't even look at him. He says, please, verse 28, look at me, for I would never lie to your face. Yield now, let there be no injustice. Yes, concede my righteousness still stands. Admit it, please. Verse 30, is there injustice on my tongue? Can I, my, uh, can I or cannot my taste discern the unsavory? In other words, what Job is saying is here, I've been walking with the Lord for a while here, guys. And you think I would know if there was sin in my life? You don't think I have searched my heart and, and tried to figure it out? But I found nothing. And as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, would you please just concede that there's integrity in my life? Give me the benefit of the doubt. Well, chapter 7, and we'll finish up here. We have the awesome privilege of Job now turning to prayer, and we get to listen in. Listen in to what he says. First here in the first five verses, he talks about the futility of life. That it's like a forced, someone who is forced to be a soldier or a hard laborer, that it's all futile. That his, his future was hopeless and his nights were sleepless. Verse 1, as he prays, Is there not a time of hard service for a man on earth? Are there not days also like the days of a hired man? like a servant who earnestly desires the shade, and like the hired man who eagerly looks for his wages. In other words, he's saying there, it, life for man, is, it's, it's futile. We're, we're all waiting for something that doesn't come, or we're, we're forced into service. Verse 3, So I have been allotted months of futility. See, we know that he's been at this for a good while already. And wearisome nights that have been appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, when I shall arise, and the night be ended. For I have had my fill of tossing till dawn. My flesh is caked with worms and dust. My skin is cracked and breaks out afresh. Now when he talks about trying to gain at least some respite in sleep, remember, Job has removed himself from society. He's not living at his house. He probably couldn't even stand to be in that place because it represents all of that loss. He's there at the garbage heap with ashes. That's where he's sleeping. And even as he tries to lie down and say, when will I arise and the night be ended? I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I can relate when he says, I've had it with this tossing all night long, this tossing until the day finally comes, till dawn. You had one of those nights where you just can't, and, and sometimes it's like, it, it tends to perpetuate itself. If you have a night like that, then the next night you think, oh goodness, I hope I can fall asleep. And then you feel it coming on, whatever it is, you know, your brain just can't shut off. Or maybe there's some anxiety that's just kind of churning around in your heart. I'll tell you what I try to do in those cases, I, it, probably because I'm connected to worship. I literally sing myself to sleep. I just start singing praise choruses. And that tends to calm my heart and bring peace to my mind to where I can drift off. But those nights, you know, when you're troubled, or maybe you're in pain, you know, that, that has a lot to do with it too. You can, your, your mind can say, yeah, we're, we're exhausted here, but your body's going, no, nah, no, nope. we got a toothache happening here. We're going to be throbbing all night long. You're going to feel your heart beat right there on the top side of your jaw. 
wearisome. Couldn't even get some relief there. Verse 6 talks about the brevity of life. My days are swifter than the weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. And he's again praying, Oh, remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will see me no more. He's talking about once he has died, once his life is over. While your eyes are upon me, I shall no longer be. As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up, and he shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him anymore. That was Job's perspective of death. Yes, Sheol looked like a place where there'd be some comfort, where he wouldn't hurt anymore. But now he's starting in his prayer. You notice as he's praying, he starts to shift his focus and awareness and realize, wow, you know when people die... It's never the same here on earth. They're gone. You could look at me in one moment, I'll just be gone. My days are swifter than the weaver's shuttle. A weaver's shuttle is that piece of wood that they would tie the yarn onto, and in the place where the, the uh, yarn was opened up, they'd throw that back and forth, move the loom, and throw it again. And they would be so good at it, you would just see that thing like lightning. You're choo, 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 back and forth. And I'm sure Job had often watched, maybe even his own wife, weaving and thinking, wow, that's, whew, there's a life right there. That's how quick it goes. That's how the brevity of life is such a reality for us. Well, moving on. Therefore, verse 11, I will not restrain my mouth. Now realize he's praying here. But I love this. Pay attention to how honest Job gets about exactly what he's feeling and the lesson that we need to learn here as we're finishing out here tonight is this is what God wants from us God does not strike Job dead here he does not rebuke him for this as a matter of fact God himself says through the prophet Isaiah come now verse uh, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 come now let us reason together you and I though your sins were as scarlet they would be white as snow they though they be red as crimson they'll be white like wool right come now let's reason together God's saying I want to hear your side of it be honest with me bring me everything that you're feeling listen to what Job does verse 11 therefore I will not restrain my mouth I will speak in the anguish of my spirit I will complain in the bitterness of my soul so here it comes am I a sea or a sea serpent that you set your guard over me he's saying God, am I like some kind of sea monster you have to capture and, and guard over me? Why? Why am I hemmed in like this? Verse 13. When I say my bed will be my comfort and my couch will ease my complaint, then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions. So I have no peace, I have no rest whatsoever. So that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than the body. I loathe my life. I will not live forever forever. Let me alone, for my days are but a breath. He's trying to reason with God in his prayer. Lord, if, if life is so short, if it's like a weaver's loom, shuttle, if, if it goes by so quickly, if I can't find any kind of peace, even as I'm sleeping, these dreams, these visions that terrify me through the night, to the point where I, I actually long for death more than I do life, and I loathe this life, and I'm not going to live forever anyway, then Lord, can you please just now leave me alone? These arrows that you've shot, this poison that's come at me, for my days are but a breath. Job, still distraught. Can you get just a sense of how deep his pain is? Finishing out verse 17. What is man that you should exalt him, and that you should set your heart on him, that you should visit him every morning and test him every moment? How long? Will you not look away from me? Let me alone till I swallow my saliva. And I, I love that. It's like Job saying, your eyes upon me, but it's, it's, it's bearing down on me to the point where I don't even feel like I can swallow my spit without you noticing, Lord. You know what? That's a true statement. That's how much God does watch over us. And we can take comfort in that. In verse 20, now again, now he's asking, first he asks his friends, if I've sinned, prove it. Now he's asking the Lord, have I sinned? 
What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am burdened to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgressions and take away my iniquity? If there's sin there, Lord, then forgive it so we can get this over with. For now I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me diligently, but I will no longer be. It's kind of like Job ends this prayer in a sense wanting to get the last laugh on God. I, you know, Lord, if you don't hurry up and do something, then by the time you try to find me, I'm going to be six feet under. And then what are you going to do? Well, it's kind of an awkward place to end, but you'll find that almost every one of these chapters is this way in the book of Job. But what we see here is, and what I love about this, is a sincerity of heart. Like I said earlier, Job doesn't pull any punches. He tells God exactly how he feels. And so if I'm this great sinner, then why doesn't God just forgive me, he asks. But then Job falls into silence again. He had vented his pain and frustration to God. He appealed to his friends for understanding. What more could he do at this point? He waits. He waits to see what will happen next. Well, unfortunately, Bildad has something to say, and we'll look at that next week. Oh, Lord, we are so thankful for these words that you do give. And as we said earlier, the details which you have chosen by your Holy Spirit to bring out these conversations. I'm sure that somewhere in here, in every little nook and cranny of these spoken words, we can find ourselves. Maybe there's been those times when we've been judgmental to our friends when they're suffering and... and in good intention, wanting to somehow bring them relief. We have misspoke. We have steered the conversation in the wrong direction. We have even suggested maybe there is sin in your life. What a tragedy for Job to hear that his friends think his kids are dead because he sinned. How, how Lord... Can you get any solace, any comfort from that? So help us as we go through these chapters and learn bit by bit these lessons that we would be able to see your sovereign hand and will as you patiently, Lord, walk through with this man. I mean, even in tonight's chapters as Job is responding and eventually praying, we don't see a lot of hope there we don't see a big breakthrough on Job's part because he's still in his misery and when we're in the depths of it you don't always expect us to be out of it either so instantaneously you walk through it with us and that hurt that we have because of the tragedies in our lives or the circumstances that have come along that have changed everything that have given us sense of hopelessness you ask us to simply look to you and you'll sit with us there you'll sit with us there in your presence and quietly allow us to work it through and when we're bitter and we complain you simply ask us to be honest with you we don't need to withhold any of that from you you can take it and in the midst of doing so, we'll slowly begin to see, as Job did, that your hand is in it, and you know what you're doing. So be with us as we move forward and walk this life that you've called us to. In Jesus' name, let's all stand.